in this room. I don't think it's happened in at least two years. But so welcome all uh, to the Maison Française. Um, it's wonderful to see you all. Welcome to a panel discussion on the politics no, of can. history in politics on the eve of the people. French presidential elections. This event is co-organized by the French Cultural Society, and I would like to especially thank Catherine Alexander and Camille Naïf Abdel Salam, who, with Laurence Marie's help, um, really sort of came to me with the idea and helped um, basically organize this event. So thank you very much. Um, we have a, a number, a number of, of students from the from the, the cultural society, French Cultural Society. So it's wonderful to see you all, and I hope um, this event. Uh, lives up to expectations. Thank you also very much to the Maison Française, Shani, Fanny, and Clara for the hospitality as usual, much appreciated. Thank you finally to our co-sponsors, the Alliance Programme and the European Institute here at Columbia. If you have been following the, the build-up to the French presidential elections over the past year, you will know that it has been a somewhat odd, rather subdued, some might even say uninspiring campaign. Five days from the first round, we find ourselves pretty much where we were last summer, indeed where we left things five years ago. Centre-right incumbent Emmanuel Macron leads the polls, flanked on the right by Marine Le Pen and further to the left by Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Others, including candidates from the two formerly dominant centre-left and centre-right parties, the Socialists and the Gaullists, as well as once favoured Greens, have been left increasingly far behind. President Macron has distinguished himself for leading an anti-campaign, or the lack of a campaign, the constitutive absence of a candidate who only officially entered the fray a month ago, and who has been doing everything to avoid any debate, let alone formulate a program ever since. He does not need to. Six weeks ago, the Russian invasion of Ukraine did what wars do, that is rally the people behind their commander-in-chief, giving his polls a much needed boost. Similarly, spiraling inflation and voter realism, le vote utile, has helped bolster support for his closest rivals on the right and on the left, pointing to a likely repeat of the 2017 elections, a runoff between Macron and Le Pen, who is quietly mounting a more realistic threat this time, and with Mélenchon en embuscade. Five years ago, and after two years of COVID pandemic, we are back to square one, perhaps a fitting ending to a flat affect election. Although he has lost ground in recent weeks, much of the media buzz has been focused on a maverick campaign on the maverick campaign of a media man. Sound familiar? Uh -huh. I am, of course, talking of Eric Zemmour, a right-wing TV pundit and essayist turned presidential candidate for the self-styled Reconquête Party, where the thing to be reclaimed is France itself, a country purportedly on the cusp of being taken over by a cabal of Islamist terrorists, delinquent immigrants and wokest Americanized intellectuals. <laughs> Underscoring Zemmour's openly Islamophobic and crypto vichyist policies and reinforcing the media frenzy around him, which at one point brought him almost neck and neck with Marine Le Pen on the extreme right, are the positions he has taken on French history. These are pure examples of historical revisionism, deforming, overlooking, inventing the past to suit contemporary politics. Of course, history is always, to a certain extent, a history of the present, written the past as used, viewed through present concerns. But in Zemmour's case, the absences are so egregious, so shamelessly cynical, calculated, and sadly effective, that many scholars and historians have felt compelled to rebuke the falsehoods, mystifications, and baiting he has spewed like venom in books and interviews. As is often said, history is a very French passion and has long been a French passion. This isn't the first time that French politicians improvise themselves as historians, nor is it the first time that historians enter the political arena to both defend the work they do and suggest new ways of thinking about the country's past when its future is at stake. Challenging a deeply ingrained roman national is no small task, however. And today, more than ever, what France can be seems to hinge on what we think it was. To help us unpack these questions, of the now, of yesterday, and of tomorrow. We are very lucky to have four accomplished speakers, all of whom have generously agreed to share their thoughts with us this evening. Furthest, uh, no, in the middle, sorry, is Jérémy Foua, who is Associate Professor of History at Aix-Marseille Université, and who is currently a member at the Institute for Advanced Studies here in Princeton. A 
specialist of the wars of religion. He is the author of Tout ce qui pond, Visage du Massacre de la Saint-Barthélemy, a, public, a book that was published last year by La Découverte and that I highly um, recommend. He is also a contributor to the book Zemmour contre l'histoire, published this uh, January by Gallimard. I saw a copy of it there. Thank you very much. Um, uh, there's a copy of it here, which is a tract, which is um, one of the concrete examples of the um, a, a collective of historians who have um, entered the political arena and decided to take Zemmour on point by point on, on dismantling, deconstructing the falsehoods that he has said about the past. Manfred Young is Associate Professor of French and Francophone Studies at Carnegie Mellon University and currently the visiting Melodia E. Jones Endowed Chair at the, at the University of Buffalo. She is, among many other things, the author of Identité Française, Banlieue, Féminité, Universalisme, and most recently, together with Julien Surdo of Universalisme, this nice little book here, which we have some examples of here in this lovely kind of plastic bag. Um, it just arrived, um, thanks to Nan. Um, my copy did not arrive. We both work for the wonderful publisher Anna Mozart, who is a militant publisher who cannot afford the international circuits of distribution. And so, as a anti-capitalist gesture, we are generously donating copies this evening in exchange for a donation of $10 if you have it on you. Um, nice this wonderful little book, Universalisme, which I highly recommend and which will bring us into one of the topics um, of for the, tonight's discussion, um, French universalism. Nicolas de Lalande is Associate Professor of History at Sciences Po Paris and is currently an Alliance Visiting Professor here at Columbia University. He is the author of Struggle and Mutual Support, forthcoming with the other press, and was also a co-editor of France in the World, a New Global History, Histoire Mondiale de la France, which was originally published in 2017 as another critical intervention by historians just before the previous presidential um, election, trying to challenge the Roman National of French history and globalizing it, bringing it into a global scale. To help us tie all of this together and place it in larger context, we're very fortunate to have with us Nadia Rubinati, who is the Kyriakos Tsakopoulos Professor of Political Theory here at Columbia University. She is a specialist of democratic and anti-democratic movements. And among her many, many publications, the most recent one is Me, the People, How Populism Transforms Democracy, published by Harvard University Press in 2019. So our speakers will each give short interventions, but, um, after which we will turn over to a set of questions prepared by the students of the French Cultural Society, um, and eventually we'll open up things to the audience too, so everybody hopefully will um, have a word. Please try to keep your questions short because we don't have much time and we have a lot of people here and it's great and we want to hear as many of you as possible. So I'd like to start perhaps with Jeremy, if, if, if you could. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you to the Maison Française. Uh, French campaign, French presidential campaign was without any doubt marked by the eruption uh, of Eric Zemmour, an amazing yet disturbing phenomenon. Zemmour likes to present himself as a historian, uh, as an intellectual, and it is true that he has published three history books. I mean, history books. Le Suicide Français, Destin Français, and Mélancolie Française. So there is a, a key word <laughs> around France. His vision of, of French past is kind of unique. Unique by the radicality of his anti-immigrationist racist position. Unique by the violence of his anti-feminist vision of history. There are no women in Zemo's history. Unique too by his love for brutality in history. So Zemmour's relationship to history poses at least two types of problem. On the one hand, moral or political problems. It's a racist, misogynistic, Islamophobic, and passeist position. But it's a moral problem. On the other hand, he also raises scientific problems. What is history? What is an historical fact? 
what is the truth in history. Is there something like historical reality behind the words, beyond the interpretation? All questions that, that Eric Zemmour puts back on the scene, and or maybe historians reading Zemmour. So for Zemmour, history is an opinion, an opinion okay. among others. And he considers he has the right to have an opinion. You have an opinion as a historian. I have my own opinion as a historian. For example, I think that blue is a great color, and I think that Dreyfus was guilty. This kind of reading you can find in Eric Zemmour. Or I think that Peter saved the Jews during World War II. This is why it seemed to us more effective to answer him on the level of truth as historians and not on the moral level rather than on the level of good or evil. So the book, this book, is quite simple. It's a series of negations. No, the Crusades were not a French victory because there was not something like France in 12th century. No, there was no genocide in Vendée. No, Pétain didn't save the Jews during the war. No, enfin, yes, Dreyfus, <laughs> yes. Yes, Dreyfus was innocent, actually. And there is no doubt about, about that. No, the Protestants were not aggressive in 16th century France. No, Simone de Beauvoir was not Madame Jean-Paul Sartre. <laughs> you may know that uh, Zemmour's major obsession is the Grand Remplacement, uh, the Great Replacement which means the replacement of us. Us is white people, Christian or Jews, by Muslims. This is the thesis of the Great Replacement. So Zemmour's fundamental idea is that from all eternity, France has struggled to avoid these Great Replacements, and that we must continue the, fact, the fight. We must continue the fight. The Crusades in 12th century was one of these battles against the Muslim, against the Great Replacement. Of course, the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572, a massacre uh, of Protestants by Catholics, was one of these battles against heretics. And we must continue this fight. So uh, you may understand that for Zemmour, Muslims are the new Huguenots, are the new Protestants, and this is a call for violence. Then Vichy, etc., etc. Secondly, I wanted to say that his vision of history is quite violent. He has a real fascination for brutality as a political tool. His hero, his hero is Richelieu. Richelieu is a perfect model of violence in history. He has a total admi admiration for the reason of state, especially when it comes to the wars of religion, to the crusades, to colonization. In the introduction uh, to one of his books, Destin Francais, Zemmour praises the iron fist, whether monarchical, imperial, or, or republican. That would have built France. And he regrets that we are no longer that we are no longer no longer capable today of the same violence. We should do a new massacre of the Saint Bartholomew. You understand better now when reading Zemmour that he has a very selective vision and a very selective reading of history which serves to legitimize his extreme political position on the subject. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, Mam, would you like to go next?
Yes, yes, yes. Merci à tous d'être d'être là. So I will center my talk around three points. The first one being the current situation um, at the eve of the political of, of the, uh, the uh, vote, with one the mainstreamization of far right and extreme right ideas, and the second one that will be extremely short: the vaporization, the disappearance, vaporization of the French left. My second point on the uses or misuses of history as illustrative. Um, I, <laughs> I need to test negative. Can you hear me? Yes. I need to test negative in three days. I'm keeping it. Uh, so my second point being on the uses or misuses of history as illustrated by the wokeist, universalist, Islamo-leftist, critical race theory debate for the past two years. And the third one, um, kind of a state of you know the field, where are we now? And what has history, you know, the, the title of this talk is Politics of History, right? So what has history taught us that we have failed or that we have refused to ignore to get to this point, right? Well, we are really, really at the, at the risk of electing um, our first common president, but also <laughs> our first far-right president. So I just wanted to start, b before getting to the current situation, prefacing that as someone working on race in France, there is absolutely no doubt, and this is something that my, my colleagues um, kind of agree with that the war on uh, the, the Russia Ukraine war saved France from a campaign that w had been centered around race in extremely extremely disgusting manner and um, this started on um, I mean th th this conversation has been going on for, for a long time but the death of George Floyd in May 2020 open really broke this dam, what we call the Republican dam. We, we usually use the, the word um, barrage républicain, right, for, uh, to, to illustrate this um, uh, contract that uh, the, far, the right and the left had to make sure that you know, any, every time we had a triangular, the uh, candidate from the far right will not be elected. But as someone working on race, universalism, citizenship in France, I call the um, Republican dam this barrage, like this really refusal in France to address any work or anchor any work on race, um, colonialism as you know something indigenous to, to France. And this dam really gave up, gave way after George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis and the demonstration that followed in the week following his death on May 25th with hundreds of thousands of people in the streets in Lyon, Bordeaux, Marseille, Paris, calling for a you know, um, a kind of anchoring of this situation, this global situation of police violence and racism à la Française, right? A need to also recognize the, the French iteration. And um, the government was forced to, to acknowledge the situation at the highest level. And we know, we remember um, Macron's infamous words in June 2020, calling these um, demonstrations a mistake and pointing fingers at um, researchers, especially social scientists who are called separatists and people who are selling false hope to French youth, selling them, you know, sending them on the streets as part of this huge race business, right? Selling false hope and calling them terrorists, uh, political terrorists breaking the republic into. So that's, that's what's up. So the current situation in France, we are, this has been um, in the works for, for a few years now, but we are at an unprecedented, I really don't like to use this word, unprecedented, but it's really the objective that, that, um, that works for the situation right now of mainstreamization of the far rights and extreme rights ideas. And we, uh, yesterday the president said that he had failed to contain the rise of the far right, and the reality is that not only he has failed, but he has actively contributed in enabling um, these discourses. And this, you know, this enabling also happened across the aisle, uh, from uh, center right, right parties to the left. I'll come to the left. And here, I mean, I can just think of just looking at the the past five years, what we call le bilan of Macron and his government, you know, Darmanin's series of laws um, in the, you know, under the guise of protecting the republic from terrorism and Islamism, dozens of mosques cl uh, closed, um, the several of these laws, the dissolution of groups uh, such as the CCIF, um, so on and so forth. Um, at the right, the center right, I'm thinking of Pécresse's doubling in the grand remplacement, grand remplacement theories 
Vogue is cutting funding for uh, several schools, and here you can think of Sciences Po Grenoble, you know, um, and you did the work for Zemmour. So really this uh, solidification and normalization of discourses, um, race and racist discourse, especially of Islamophobia, with uh, under the guise again of, of protection of the republic and really the weaponization of laïcité that became, I mean, this is really what I did, what we defend in our book, dog whistle politics to talk about Muslims without sounding Islamophobic. The weapon is the vaporization of the left. That's it. <laughs> We've seen it. We are. Um, it, it's sad. I'm not, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. I mean, from um, the, the Parti Communiste who sell basically grounding um, his entire campaign on the defense of true France, rural France. <laughs> to be French is to eat meat. To be French is not to wear pink as a man. To be French is to drink wine. Hidalgo, <laughs> I'm going to stop here um, and get to my second point, which is the uses and misuses of history. So what we've seen uh, throughout this quinquennat is the way, and this is, I mean, w this is not new. We, we, we go back to Chirac, Sarkozy, but there is really a way history and the roman national, two more minutes, history and the roman national are being weaponized to really draw a, li a line in the sand between what is France, what is not France, and more importantly, who is French, who is not French. And this has been really illustrated in the past two years through the debate, you know, you thought wokeism was an American thing? Hey guys, we have you two in France. And it sounds really, really sexy in French, les woke. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so wokeism and, um, and uh, the, 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 the craziness around critical race theory, the debate around Islamo leftism. So this coalition, you, you may remember the Minister of Higher Education say, launching um, an, an official inquest uh, uh, against Islamo leftism that she called um, the bastard child of um, Ayatollah Khomeini and Mao, uh, Mao Zedong and trying to understand by studying Islam or leftism in France why Confederate flags were flying in the US Capitol. I'm still trying to understand what that, all that means. So really this, this conflation of words, of um, theories, of themes that were uh, emptied out, right, reinvested, c coming at a point where things didn't mean anything. This is what um, so Eric Fassin called la philosophie du n'importe quoi. And <laughs> among all of that, this cloud of n'importe quoi, what comes out is, was that some things are French and others are not. And this is really what we are actively fighting against. I mean, as Charimi said, by bringing truth. But we've come at a point where even truth is complicated, right? And my third point is, and now, what do we do? How did we get to this point? How do we get to a point where, how do we fight against the mythologies that brought us here? The first one being that the Republic is immune to racism, right? We can't be, um, we'll never be able to elect a, a president from the far right because racism was dismantled by the Republic. That's the mythology. The second mythology being that liberal democracies not only are immune, but have in them the remedies or you know, the vaccine. I mean, this is, we, we talk a lot about vaccines right now, that are remedies that will take away or keep away far, the far right. And we know that not only this is not true, that they don't have a remedy against far right ideas, but they constitute, do constitute a natural terrain for the development of these ideas. How do we move forward? Right between these, this balance, the brain drain. This is one more minute. Uh, uh, right now, we uh, we for the past two years, we've noticed um, a terrific brain drain from uh, in France of Muslims, um, racialized French, leaving the the, the country, um, a state of civic fatigue, and really feeling that we are in this void and this kind of you know. Um, craze where words don't mean anything, so how do you fight against this? And on the other end, the new utopias that, are, that is created by political movements um, coming from the peripheries, the banlieues, but also um, the fact that you know, in universities, in research centers, people are organizing and creating these little um, answers and responses, you know, trying to get back on the civic arenas and um, 
uh, the next five years might look gloomy, but I'm really optimistic because we are going to fight this fight. Um. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, Nicola, can we have you here, please? Thank you. Thank you, Tamar. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. So, um, Tamar asked me to, to say a few words about uh, past experience, uh, the publication five years ago of the Histoire Mondiale de la France. And maybe it will help us make some comparison and see that uh, I completely agree that the situ situation is even worse today, in the sense that, uh, of course, the, the focus on national identity is not a new thing. I mean, it started a long time ago, it was really very high point in. in, 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 in 2007 with uh, Sarkozy, and then we had the creation of the Minister of the United National Immigration. So it was already something really central to the presidential campaign. But the, the real novelty today uh, in this uh, in this current campaign was uh, the fact that we had a, a truly anti-Republican uh, 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 candidate assuming xenophobic, petenist, reactionary positions. So you could say that this position, but already in his book, in this book, the book published, and that, that you mentioned, that the fact that starting in September, last September, it could really uh, uh, be uh, uh, discussed and promoted in the public space was something that, of course, was really tragic. And what we measure now that maybe Zemmour one day will disappear, but the, the real, I mean, the real effect of this situation is not that Le Pen is appearing as a Republican, moderate, normal person. And this is what is really fighting for the second one. So we need to mobilize. The vote is still useful. Many of Nothing is done, but I mean, clearly, we can see that the new novelty is that it is changing the image of Marine Le Pen, and it is bringing some uh, 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 vote reserve for her for the second one. Exactly. So this will be a unique, singular uh, political situation that we will have in, 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 yeah. in one week, and, and for the for the, uh, the period between the, the two ones. <laughs> so there are two two questions in this debate about the politics of history. The first is how do politicians use and misuse history for their own perspective? Purpose and for framing their platform. So uh, I, I won't really uh, develop on that. We have a, a, a few ideas and we mentioned already. And then there is this, this question, I think this is the, the common uh, interrogation we have of uh, how do we react to that? How, as historian, as social scientist, as researcher, so we, we know how and we try to react as citizens, but then there is this, the question of the specificity of our attitudes and answers, uh, of our contributions as people. Uh, uh, to the business of writing history, but assuming at the very same time that history is the public thing, and so we are not defending the writing history of history as a corporate dimension, because that most of the, uh, the science today we recognize the legitimacy of public history. So in a way, we are in, in, a, in an awkward position in which we say that the past is owned by and can be uh, 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 told by many people from various instances, but we have to be careful about the line, the boundaries between what's true and what's false, and uh, uh, how, uh, uh, in a way, telling the past is also about assuming a scientific research. So for me, this debate of the relation between history and politics has to be compared to the debate uh, uh, on the relation between science and politics more largely, on the COVID, on the climate, and so on. So this is, well, there is something very specific about history because our political cultures and institutions have been shaped through history, but in a way, we are, uh, I mean, in the same situation and deadlock, or just trying to collectively uh, uh, defend uh, the idea of the autonomy of science, but also the contribution of science uh, within the public sphere and the public debate. So we can imagine several uh, uh, types of reaction, and I mean, the, the book Zemo contre l'histoire uh, is a, uh, was really a, a, an expected answer from historians to react to counter uh, false arguments, but. This is a defensive position that was highly, highly demanded at that particular moment. So I would say that five years ago, when we published with a, a large collective uh, team uh, the Histoire mondiale de la France, we were uh, in, a, in, a, in a gloomy moment. I mean, uh, it was really after the terrorist attacks and the two, 2015 and 70 period, so a very depressing moment. But we had the idea of trying to produce something that wouldn't be uh, uh, only reactive to a, a, a dangerous narrative, but would like to offer mm -hmm. something new to produce some alternative views about uh, 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 the national past or about how to write uh, uh, the history of the nation. So I think that there were three elements that really uh, uh, accounted for uh, the fact that this book at that particular moment had some success and find a public. 
first was really the political context. Of course, it was published uh, in January 2017, but we live with the, this really de depressing moon. I mean, there was a collective uh, att attitude of the, the French population. Of course, that, that's already, uh, Marine Le Pen was there, and she was really high, you know, uh, at that moment. But at the same time, the, the two uh, uh, pastors had been so depressing that in a way, trying to produce uh, uh, some uh, uh, open narratives of the nation uh, 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 was also welcomed by the people who would uh, uh, react and uh, uh, um, uh, get interested in this book. Then there was the second element was about the, the editorial innovation. So the fact that the book was a, a collective book, which is not so original, but based on short essays, uh, short notices with a long durée perspective. So trying to address the, uh, and to promote a non-nationalist vision of the nation, pluralist, open to various spaces, voices, and lives, but uh, accounting for the fact that historians, yes, they, they may take the nation as a unit, they may take the global as a unit, the regions, and so on, but in a way, we have something to say about that without uh, reproducing essentialist visions of the nation. And in a way, we are trying to, to show that and to display that in the form of the book, and also uh, calling to the possibility for the, the, the readership to play with the book, to travel across the book, uh, and to find uh, and to, to make the reader uh, uh, as an active uh, uh, actor in the in the construction of the connections, the network that we can find in this in this long uh, uh, history, and with a, a very important fact that was to to to, to basically get, get rid of the idea of the origins of the nation, and this is of course completely, completely at odds with. Uh, 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 Zemmour or other kind of vision where, 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 where you need to have a starting point to say it started there, it will finish there, maybe so that uh, otherwise we will see. So, so the, the, this uh, non originalist uh, uh, vision was really important. And then, third, that was a scientific proposal uh, 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 in the sense that all the texts uh, uh, were based on a scientifically uh, based uh, research uh, uh, um, uh, uh, that um, work with the idea of exhaustivity, which is something that is sometimes hard to just to to argue in the public space, and it's the fact that science is not about telling everything about the nation, it's but, uh, also about uh, uh, stimulating, triggering reflection through snapshots into uh, uh, the past. And with this uh, also, uh, this uh, uh, the, the fact that uh, all the, the texts were uh, edited, uh, uh, attached to the truth, and also based on, on recent discoveries. And the idea also to, to put into the national framing uh, recent trends that are uh, so interesting to us, I mean, uh, for instance, imperial history, global history, environmental history, to show how these these new trends are not just uh, trendy ways of doing things, working things, but are really a way also to uh, uh, re-explore something that people thought that were already new, and a way showing how history is a creative attitude toward the past, but also toward the present. In a way, that was this connection that we are trying. So, in conclusion, because I imagine I'm far too long, what 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 what, what were the, the maybe the, the, the principal ambitions of this book? First. Uh, uh, the idea was to, to, to say that uh, uh, in spite of the variety of approaches that we have, we, we may consider that the nation is a unit that uh, uh, needs to be addressed, but with uh, new perspectives. Second, that uh, 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 we need to think and to build together uh, uh, more pluralistic visions of the nation and to open it to a plurality of discourse. And in a, f in a way, the, the structure of the book uh, was uh, uh, open to this variety, so, and there were other criticisms saying, but what do you make of the, you know, the line or uh, narrative of the national origin? In a way, if we want to uh, be fair to uh, uh, the complexity of this nation or other nation or other political entities, we need to make space for uh, uh, all these voices, different voices, and try to weave together without assuming only one single point of uh, analysis of uh, a narrative explaining that would be, uh, uh, of course, the imposition of uh, one dominant position. And then the, the, the last element of it for me uh, uh, in this position was also to assume that uh, uh, history is a way to, to, to stimulate new interrogation and to assume some uncertainty about the past. And this is something that is, I think for me, uh, I consider it is really critical and the same for scientists and the COVID showed that, that just when you display the uncertainty of science, the fact that every science is, is about revising our past knowledge, it, we are in a way, uh, 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 meeting a, a, a lot of uh, disappointment by the people. And when you are explaining that, so people would say, so there is no history as you are always, ch always changing your mind about it. But of course, this is a different thing to uh, 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 establish the fact and to reflect about the interpretation. But I mean, this is something that is really connecting uh, 
uh, uh, uh, our task as an, an over scientist, I would say, to uh, 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 demonstrate and defend the autonomy of a scientific discourse within the public space and the public discourse. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicola. And finally, Nadia. Oh, yes? Yep, you can. Okay. So thank you for uh, having me here to talk about uh, France, but in fact Europe. So I'd like to uh, uh, present France in this moment, at least because of the elections, definitely, uh, as a kaleidoscope uh, through which we can read both politics in a democratic kind of society now in Europe and Europe. Politics uh, in the democratic sense, because these, as the uh, three um, presenters have very well shown to me at least, uh, it is an interesting uh, moment of populistic uh, opinionism. Opinionism is what characterizes today. I mean, uh, the neo-idealist uh, historians and philosophers of the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Collingwood, uh, Croce, uh, the long tradition, they spoke about uh, History as made in the present. Our present makes history. The question is that they were professional historians. Today, we make history. We, I mean, all these, uh, you know, uh, politicians, I don't know. They make history, uh, but they create history through opinion. So what they do is they make the history that in the opinion making uh, and the audience of the day is more successful. So they, they both contribute in making history, as history they want to be seen, and they contribute to condition the opinion of the time. So that uh, all the ideologies that we uh, be listen, racism, anti-feminism, anti-gender. Gender is an issue in Europe that is incredible. Gender is like a you know, uh, scapegoat for everything that is negative, absolutely. And, um, and so brutality in the language, everything coalesces together to create this opinionism concerning what? Opinionism is a way of listing the anti. I mean, in all the conversation we had until now, I understood only one thing clearly, what they didn't, they don't certainly want, what they despise, what they would like to eliminate, what they would like to erase. So it's anti, anti, anti-Islamism, um, anti-immigration, anti-gender, anti-liberal. So this is a truly a radical moment because there is, as a substance, as something unifying this anti is simply the uh, politics of publicity of the very leader, of the, of, the, of the opinion maker who makes also himself. So that is crucial to the entire transformation of democracy everywhere, I would say. Yeah. Not only in France, uh, and not only in my country, which is uh, incredible, I mean Italy, but also in this country. Uh, I mean, Trump was a master in this uh, opinionism. He invented, uh, he invented conspirationism in terms of uh, skepticism, uh, throwing gossiping on everything, uh, throwing doubts on everything. Uh, he invented, we think, does it exist? Uh, that is an incredible, uh, it's, it's, it's a transformation of the perspective of knowledge in relation to the public and to politics. So this is an important, I don't know the outcome of this since it is so quick to be consumed. One may be even optimistic, there is nothing going there because after all, this doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, sclerotize, doesn't even grow, it's ch it changes every day, but I'm not so um, optimistic. The second has to do with Europe, because we never mentioned almost Europe, uh, <laughs> apart from you, you mentioned the war. Um, Europe is in a war, clearly. It's not in, in Ukraine. It's absurd. The war is everywhere. First of all, because the war made each uh, democratic, uh, domestic uh, opinion divided. There is a division that is so huge between those who are in favor of sanctions and those who are not those who are in favor of NATO and those are not. And anti-Americanism is everywhere. Anti-NATO is everywhere. And this goes together with this right-wing, strong right-wing of uh, a kind that is very, in my view, frightening. Because uh, the right-wing anti-Americanist or the right-wing anti-NATO is really problematic. 
So that is a moment, and it is a moment in which, uh, remember, Sunday, Orban, Stra won in his country, 60%. And Orban is the one who, along with uh, um, Marine Le Pen, Salvini, and Putin, and Trump, they wanted to create, not ages ago, but few years ago, the international of populism. For them, it meant of sovereignism. It meant uh, everything that has to do with the anti, anti-immigration, anti-Islam, and so on and so forth. So it's back. And Orban is connected to Putin, not to the other member states in Europe. In Europe. So the growth of anti-liberalism in the good sense, not the liberalism like uh, the economic uh, rampant uh, uh, selfish uh, liberalism. I mean, liberalism as the basic rights and decency and dignity of human beings. This is under threat today in Europe. I saw it. I see it every moment. And the war, and the, the uh, even the sympathy toward Putin in many countries of Europe needs to be well understood. So I would situate the tr these elections within this context to understand the paradox. First, and then I close, Macron. Macron, who was always very timid uh, toward NATO, now is becoming the defendant of NATO. This is very, con very opposite. Or Trump, or uh, Macron, who was not so much popular, perhaps loved, beloved in his country, but in Europe. In Europe, Macron meant Europe. If you go everywhere in Europe, which, me, which means good and bad, because they don't, those who don't like Europe don't, don't like uh, Macron, and there are many, many of them. So I think uh, these pa paradoxes and these contradictions are today uh, in these elections. Orban two days ago, Macron perhaps in, w in one week, uh, they seem to be very distant, very far away, but have something in common somehow. They are representing a continent, Europe, that is sinking in one way or another, sinking instead of uh, the European Union is under threat, definitely is very close to an end if it goes in this way, uh, with this war. And these two leaders, who are go who one won, the other one is going to win, they represent uh, the problems of Europe. On the one hand, uh, Orban is evident, the other one, who is a leader without a party, is a leader without the strength of a party, that is a leader very weak somehow, and is made strong by the weakness of the moment and the problems of the moment more than by his own uh, constituency. So it is democracy with weak parties and democracy with strong nationalism and identity politics in the wrong sense. This is what uh, I see. I'm sorry if I'm so op um, pessimistic, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I just arrived two days ago from Europe and I feel really far away. Here, Europe seems to be so far, uh, so far. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Glad to have you back. Thank <laughs> you. So, um, th thank you all four of you ever so much for, for, for everything you had to say and for being so diligent with, uh, with keeping to time. Um, we have a bit of time to open the floor up to questions and we're going to start with questions that Catherine and Camille have collected from various members of the, of the French mm -hmm. Culture Society. So if you would please like to, to yeah, share some of those questions. Let's just ask them in English and, and if we need to, because we don't have much time. Yeah. And, and therefore everybody and whoever wants to respond can so how can we talk in how can we talk about French colonial history in a way that is healthy and sane and for the debate? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I can answer big question. I can answer both okay. Uh, so we'll go me by talking about it first. Um, I just wanted to, to um, quickly, really quickly answer um, what you said. Um, you know, about the disappearing of basic rights all over Europe. And when I think of France and the borders of France, um, the borders of France are not just the hexagon. The borders of France are um, in the Indian Oceans. France is in America. France is Guyana. And right now, the border of Europe is in Morocco, right? 
So when we talk about the disappearance of basic, of human, of basic human rights, um, it might appear now loudly, more visibly, because it's touching white bodies, right? When we think of how we, our new understanding of police violence, because white bodies are being maimed in the streets of Paris in November 2018, and getting the same bite of the sticks that black bodies and indigenous bodies have been getting from Guyana to Pointe à Pitre, I think one, one thing that might be very important, and, and this is why I'm very optimistic about this, is that I don't think that this is the end, it's just the end of a cycle, and I'm optimistic because now, instead of one, a minority wanting things to change, I think the a majority is getting kind of a taste of what has been the deprivation of basic rights. Uh. Um, we've been living in a republic, we talk about universalism, universalism was a failed project from the beginning, women couldn't vote, uh, poor people couldn't own properties, slavery was an, was an institution, slavery was abolished, and we so there's a moment where we need to understand that we can't just live on myth, and we have to make these ideals a reality, and I think that one of the, um, and I'm just really going to finish on, on this, one of the, uh, the exit, right, the solution for us is to embrace our colonial history, see how we can truly become a post-colonial country, be, be in, um, because refusing this history, right, what makes us uh, one, uh, we are running the risk of becoming a post-republican country. So just start by talking about it and, and acknowledging that this is us, this is not anti, right, we're not anti-France. My family's been in France since 1830. When I call myself Afro-French, I'm not anti-France. It's the reality of me being both French and black, and that reality needs to be acknowledged. Anybody want to add to that? Yeah, Nicola, do you want to add to that? Thanks. Yeah. Since this is a debate, I would like maybe to disagree with her. Um, on this question of the equation between people like Macron, Orban, and no, I didn't equate. No, 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 I know. No, you, oh said, you, said, you, said, you said this, no, I mean. I pa, didn't pa, equate pa, at all. No, 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 I, I'm not saying that you are, but you said they are part of the same crisis. The, oh, yes, 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 I, I, yes. I, I, I listened to it, but just <laughs> okay. there was an argument that was made for some years, saying that, look, uh, and there has been a lot of police violence in France, but people who say this is the same thing as in Russia. And as, in? as in Russia. People, many people would say, and for me this oh, is part of this is part of the Russian propaganda. This has been to say that look, there has nothing to be defended in your liberal democracies because they are only about hypocrisy. Uh, 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 pretending to different rights but using the same means against their population. And you would have many people in political conversations saying, come on, look. What's the difference? We 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 not we are not living anymore in a democracy. And this, I mean, this feeling, this perception, the fact that you are defending this view for me, it's too pessimistic. And in a way, I it's playing the game. No, no that's I, it's just. And I'm, I'm not saying that you are. But if you if we really really uh, 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 build on this pessimistic mood, in a way, uh, uh, that's also digging the yes the hole for democracy. In a way, if you don't believe in it and you say it's always the end of it, okay. In a way, we are maybe. So you don't think that we are in this moment? No, I don't think. No, I, I think there are some political, uh, more uh, legal differences in regimes, and that if we want these things to be defended, we have to think about their real differences. And I won't say that. And we we'll have this question in two mm -hmm. weeks' time. Mm -hmm. we, we, many people in the left in front will have this. Yeah. I won't vote for yeah. the Macron yeah. guy because. Yeah of the Gilets jaunes because mm -hmm. of the Darmanin policies, because mm -hmm. the anti-immigration policies. Mm -hmm. And it's really tough because, I mean, we, we said, and, and Darmanin is the one who said to Le Pen last year, you are too soft. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah. So he, he was really playing that game. But in, in a way, that, that is a collective uh, 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 um, uh, threat for us uh, and a trick in which we are in a way locked. But I was just mentioning that because this is sensitive to, to me because it, it's not about a scientific gaze about that, but I think in political conversations, this is something we have been debating for so many, so many years that seems to be important. Can I ask just a question sure. so that people can understand Nicolas' uh, intervention? Yeah. Damana is the uh, Ministry of Interior for, for Macron, right? So he was in a TV, um, I'm sorry, he was in a TV uh, debate with Le Pen, and uh, she said 
Islam is a religion like all others. I have nothing against Islam and I have something against political Islamism. And he said, he responded, you're too soft. Right. To yeah. our students who might not yeah. So helping with the sort of normalization yeah. of, of the extreme right that, that we've been talking about. Um, we luckily we have we have dinner together afterwards, so we can continue that. questions, yeah. I want to I want to make sure if, yeah, if, 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 if everybody's okay just to yeah. go back to the the questions the from question. the students, please, please, and, and and then we can really open it up. Um, Catherine, do you, do you want to ask questions? Thank you. So this is a general question. In what way would you say that the current situation in France is similar to the situation elsewhere? <laughs> no, no, I'm not yeah. French, so oh. <laughs> not French. Yeah. I mean, yeah. but, I, so, but I'd like simply to clarify something so that <laughs> I can answer. Okay, we do this over dinner. I think we can answer her questions and then we can talk over dinner. Yeah. Why so? Why is important, in my view at least? Uh, the, the literature on the crisis of democracy is 20 years old now. And it's not a banal one, in the sense that there is an attempt to understand the crisis of institutionalized parties, the, um, the different relationship between public opinion and institutions, the formation of public opinion. You know, this is Habermas, my God. So that, this means not that we are, everybody is equal to everybody else, or Macron is the same thing of, uh, of Putin. There are two expressions in this moment, at least, uh, in a different way, of uh, discontent and this uh, uh, dysfunction of that democracy. And of the two, unfortunately, unfortunately, to say, of the two, the most organized one is precisely the right wing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They are very organized. They are hegemonic, Gramsci. They are much more organized. The other ones are floating in the air. And they find sometimes a good leader, sometimes they don't. But they, they, who are the other ones? People who are in favor of constitutional democracy. So in this sense, France, of course, is unique, like all countries is unique in its own internal discourse. Uh, but uh, there are similarities because after 70 years of common European Union or living together, we have also developed many uh, problems together, immigrations, and now also uh, money in the weaponry. So for the first time after 70 years, Germany is putting 100,000 euro into, um, million euros into money, in, into army, into weaponry. This is new and this is happens everywhere, not only in Germany. So there are similarities and differences and the similarities are anti-immigration, they are uh, uh, intolerance toward diversities, so there are these, these are problems, we have to see them and to, uh, and to rely with them, not to cover up, not to, to consider them minor, inferior, no pro within parentheses, as they used to say with fascism years ago, a parentheses. No, this is, for me, at least, I have this uh, approach to, mm -hmm. see, uh, to see the problems and to throw and to go through it until the end. And then, uh, and then people are capable or not of reacting, this depends on the citizen. But certainly, the critical moments is up, it's mm -hmm. important for us. So lots, mm -hmm. lots of comparison, lots of, yeah. lots of parallel trends. Do, we, do you want to ask one more question, perhaps, from the from the, the, the society, and, and then we can really open it up to everybody else? Um, so can I ask a question? Maybe choose one. Yeah. So the first question is how historical narratives are set selected by demagogues, and the second. Oh what? Are selected. Are oh, selected. selected. And the second one is the impact of the Declaration of Human Rights and the Constitution on French politics today. So in terms of gender, in terms of uh, asylum rights, race, and identity. Uh, Shalini, do you want to talk a bit about the narrative? Yeah, I mean, I'm the 16th century guy here. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but I think it's really yeah, interesting yeah, the, yeah. The, what, what, you, what you say about how the, the St. Bartholomew's yeah. Day massacre, a very sort of Franco-French mm -hmm. um, problem is, is sort of turned around and turned into an excuse for 
kicking out and maybe even slaughtering all foreigners in, in, in France, right? And yeah. This is, this is quite strange when you look at Zemmour's uh, reading of this massacre. In general, it's a very, very well-known massacre in France. And in general, everyone say, and it's terrible, and it's, and it's bad. All the books that have, have been written on this subject is, okay, this is uh, a spot on French history. And for the first time, I think, after Drummond, who is uh, of course, of course right wing head. yes, uh, Drummond, one of the most influence. For the first time af after Drummond, there is someone who say that maybe uh, the Saint Bartholomew's Day massacre was not enough. That uh, maybe Catherine. And uh, this is very interesting because if uh, for Zemo it was uh, a failure, it's because Catherine of Medici was a woman. An Italian woman. An Italian woman, <laughs> worse. Medici. Medici, yeah. And, uh, smart? Women, uh, smart, but uh, she failed. Of course. <laughs> women failed. And who succeeded in killing Protestant Protestantism in France? Richelieu, of course. Uh, 15 years Jesuit. later. Yeah. And a man, of <laughs> course. And a Catholic uh, man. Yeah. So he has a very terrifying reading of this uh, period of history. And I have to say, quite uh, interesting. It's, it's really interesting. It's it's crazy. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's very violent uh, and very symptom symptomatic of what he wants to do with uh, foreigners, with uh, minorities, uh, and very worrying too. I just wanted to. Um, I think there's a way to tie both your questions with hers. On, on the role of history and, and what, you know, we talked about the commonalities between France and uh, other countries, and look at, when I say other countries, I'm talking about here, right? And, um, but what I think that one of the difference, which again is something that really fills me with optimism, I know I don't, I work in the US, I spend, I split my time between France and the US, so things might be, you know, kind of easier for me being in the US that I don't get the brunt of what some of my colleagues um, working in French academia, but for example, during the whole Islamist, you know, Islam leftist hoopla. But one thing that really fills me with hope and that ties both your questions are what are the differences with France? With France, when you think of the construction of history and the way history was, you know, like backed up the creation of national I identity, the way the national narrative was constructed as this top-down narrative, it's r extremely solid, right? But then I moved to the U.S. at 26. And it's at Brown University for the first time that I, that I realized that Haiti and Saint-Domingue were, were the same country and that they were French colonies. <laughs> it's at Brown, and I'm a product of, you know, most of us were a product of Place Prépa, where you learn really the canon of French history, the French culture, French literature, that for the first time I hear the name of Marie Sondé, that for the first time I hear the name of Fanon, and I'm like, what? Right, so we learn this extremely solid history but then once you start unveiling all of the things that were left aside, and I always tell my students to think about scale. You know, when we told, for example, forget about slavery, we're not talking about something that happened over a week, we're not talking about something that, you know, we're talking about something that happened for 420 years and that literally spanned from one corner of the globe to another. And it, when you think about how we were able to hide that and build this national identity, this, this history, this extremely cohesive Roma national, it fills me with hope because it means that there are so many things, so many doors that are left open, and maybe I'll exit through this whole situation. If we're able to survive the next five years, the exit will be through some of these doors that we are opening. And I ended up with this new movement, right? We, when I think of alternative, I think of things like La Verité for Adama, of where for the first time we see this coalition of movements, um, researchers, activists from the banlieue, um, working on you know, ecology, um, uh, questioning what the vivant is, and questions of politics. And I think that there's something that's happening here and really backed up by colonial history. We need to talk about this, and it might be our way out. I mean, we don't have, you know, a bubble. I mean, I'm not Miss Cleo. I don't really know this <laughs> is. But we've tried so many other things. Let's try this one. Let's open this door. Ah. Yeah. You could have to add two words quickly before we... Yeah, two words. Go on. 
No, you can have to, four. To, to, to answer your, your, your first question, I mean, two words. <laughs> okay. Now, so we, we, we could work on the idea of what are the communities of these uh, uh, conservative narratives. And I mean, there are lots of uh, topics that we could uh, uh, explore, but there is the idea of purity, national purity. I mean, all these narratives are, they, 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 they start with the idea that there is a, a certain point in origin uh, which is defined as the purity of the nation, and then it's all about just mixing, declining, and degeneration. Mm -hmm. you know? So there is this idea of the golden age, which is so classical, I mean, that kind of narrative. And there is a, a really the love for uh, the big man, the great man. So that's why mm -hmm. these, all these people are really mad at social history, gender history, colonial history, because where are the big, the tough, the, the, this man that we learned at school and we are so fond of them, he had the pictures in our books and so on. So in a way, they say they are accusing the sons of stealing, you know, stealing the past, stealing their identity, stealing their youth. It's really about that. Mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of thing we have to to correct and to convince that the story that as historians we are telling is much more interesting and true to the past than that kind of fantasy about the only rule of big men. So and in that kind of in the French perspective that would be all about Louis XIV, Napoleon and something between Pétain and the Gaulle and say you know, I've made a choice. But that's that's that would be the summary of uh, the, the national narrative. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few more minutes for, for, for questions from the audience. Yes, I'll take. Like Colleague, Colleague Emmanuel Sadat, please. Thank you so much. I wanted to bring um, a figure that has not been brought uh, up yet here, and that's uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Yes. He's on the line of French people trying to find an alternative to the very, very hard situation in which we are, right? Those two poles that Nadia was mentioning, right, between um, the French, uh, or well, the Marie Le Pen, right, uh, Martine Le Pen, 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 is someone who has, you know, also completely is popular, is yeah. in this in this kind of discourse of the homo national, it's slightly different, right, on the map with the revolution as one of the crucial moments. But the pop, the people in this central actor of this discourse and this mm. region of history, the people in uh, <laughs> the French people, right? It's very close to uh, the way I read it, and I've read it from my uh, French lawyer. Paris uh, in 2017 and 2012 was very close in the intention is uh, trying to capture the electorate of, of Le Pen, very close to something that, you know, this nationalist vision. So the problem is on the left, I mean, we're not, you know, these are going around, but there is no alternative that is, you know, non-nationalist, not an authoritarian, not populist. There is no, that, that's, that's where we are. And, and this, to me, is also kind of like blocked into that vision of, the, of the French nation as an entity of the, you know, like as an instance of the And there is no solution that I don't think there is a yeah, that's a great point. Does anybody want to? Quick, any, anybody have a quick solution uh, from uh, the Milan? <laughs> what, what do we do on Saturday? No, no, just to add a Saturday. To, to connect with uh, Nadia Zuma. Uh, Mélenchon is uh, against economic sanctions. He's an against, he's a populist too. Yeah. Yeah. And among two populists, the most original one, the right, the right wing, wins. Because Mélenchon, after all, is a copy of populism. It, because the left cannot be a populist, if you think. It's more universalist in, tra in the tradition. Mm. Mm. So as soon as they try to become or to appear like populists, there is a disaster because uh, they have to lose to m or to abandon too many fundamental principles. Inclusion, equality, universalism. I mean, uh, they become a new nationalism. So I have one more question over there. So was it? Yes, just to, to, to follow up your, your, your question, Emmanuel, uh, I think uh, Mélenchon just made more reference to Michelet than to anything else. It's quite mentioned the, mm. the, 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 the people of that. I definitely understand this point as well. My question is uh, how do you explain that actually the dominant narrative, historical narrative in France, is a conservative narrative? Is it a matter of generation, a matter of skills that historians have, do, don't have? Is it just because of this huge deconnection between the academic and the media. 
you know, there's a way to put these questions, how do we go beyond mm -hmm. this platform there? Mm -hmm. Because we already talked. Maybe we, we, maybe we, we want to bust the platform there. But at some point, we only talk to the people who already agree on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can answer really quickly. So, you know, my, my point is that maybe we might want to bust that platform de verre, right? We are trying to um, say something that is no more. It's really my position that the, the next five years might be hard, but again, maybe this is the beginning of a new cycle, right? That we can't, we're trying to hold on, and I mean, last the last time you predict, it's over, right? So, um, there's really, and France is not an exception, we are really into, you know, the tropes of this, like, necropolitics, and, and you talked about this, this ideas of death and, 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 and replacement, and we are not, we are no more, and when, when you turn the page, we really have to not let ourselves be completely inundated by these ideas because what I see when I work, you know, from Grigny to Manguel is politics of life, vitality, vitality, so much new bloods and ideas and new ways of doing politics. So maybe we need to bust that plafond de verre and, and see what, what is going to be, you know, to come out of that. We have time, no, there, can we just one more, one more, we have time for one more question before we get kicked out, so. And yeah, and, and just about the, the, there's a lot of things happening Changing. right now between, you know, researchers and, and, and the people no, and the new ways of doing politics, seconds. things are happening in France, it's happening, you know, away from BFM TV and C News and politics is happening, you know. Les gens ont marre des politiques mais pas de la chose politique. Just one, one oui, juste uh, pour répondre à, à David uh, rapidement, uh, je pense qu'il ne faut pas non plus trop en demander à l'histoire. Et, et je dis ça en, en tant qu'historien, uh, je trouve ça assez symptomatique que tous ces hommes politiques et par le temps d'histoire uh, soient à ce point tournés vers le passé. Je comprends bien que cette gauche en décomposition, en perte de repères, uh, fasse appel uh, à Napoléon, fasse appel à Jean Jaurès, uh, fasse appel à Louise Michel, mais uh, uh, les, 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 les défis uh, auxquels on a... Uh, à faire aujourd'hui, hein, le, le changement climatique, euh, ouais. le, les réfugiés, euh, la révolution numérique, euh, l'égalité ouais. homme-femme, euh, une grande partie des réponses ne sont pas ni chez Clovis, ni chez Pétain, ni, ni donc, euh, <rire> euh, <rire> voilà. Je, <rire> je dis, voilà, l'histoire, évidemment, je suis historien, c'est important, mais euh, voilà, voilà. <rire> une grande partie des réponses ne sont pas dans l'histoire. Euh, je pense très sincèrement que l'histoire ne donne aucune leçon ne, de, ne devrait pas donner de leçons. Great. So, that's yes. a good point. So, so yeah. reflection on that. We'll have one last question, please, here in the front. Oh, it's so nice. No, it's not. 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 Part of the left also, maybe in a way, responded to that by using uh, racialist discourses on the news uh, to some regards. Um, and don't you think that there's been sort of a, an American reading of France? And do you think do you think that there's such thing first? And do you think that this will modify the way we make history and talk about history uh, in France? Do we have it? No, I don't think so that Nadia uh, used the term the scapegoat to, to mention gender and the role of like, the conservative politics in Europe at the moment. I mean, this, this question of uh, tackling uh, indigenism, uh, wokeism, or so on was really the scapegoat created by conservative forces just to, 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 to put forward an opposition between a, a dominant conservative narrative, which it is not, it's, it may be dominant, but that's not the, not the only narrative. And uh, uh, in a way, opposing this 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 threat, which is a minority threat. I mean, and it's uh, it's, it's present, but uh, uh, it was really based on an exaggeration of their uh, weight in uh, the academia. And so, so I would be more skeptical uh, and paying attention to the really the, the strategic construction of you know, this uh, uh, discourse. But going back to the to the previous question, so I think wh what we we will need to get rid of is the idea that we, we can't have a common understanding of the past. So in a way, we are, we are in front of competing visions. And so, and the, the Zemo view was 
has always always been there. I mean, it, it was there, but it, it became more audible. And in a way, there are so many things that uh, that disappeared. Uh, you know, barriers, uh, mental, moral barriers that disappeared. That it was possible that he would revive a discourse that was already present mm -hmm. just after the Second World War. But we have also to look to the other side. I mean, there are new things, new ways of addressing the past that are really, really innovative. I mean, and I don't want to be uh, in a position to defend uh, any official policy, but uh, look at uh, how our uh, uh, collective attitude toward the, the Algerian war has changed. I mean, the recognition that the fact that there was a responsibility of, I mean, the, for Mor the Maurice Sodin Maurice Maurice affair. It, it wasn't, you couldn't imagine that kind of symbolic official change of the, the, the official position of France 10 years or 15 years ago. So there are some issues on which the recognition of the diversity and of the moral and penal response or the criminal responsibility of the French, tense, French uh, state over the past uh, is something that we are reckoning with in a, in a way admitting more. And that, that's, that in a way that's why People like Zemo are so crazy about that. So what? Why are you putting Josephine Baker in the Panthéon? I mean, they are mad about that. You I'm could mad say about that too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you, you, you can be mad about. Yes, you, I mean, this is purely symbolic, and you could say you could have the interpretation is symbolic politics to just to uh, hide uh, other kind of uh, more brutal or uh, anti-republican politics and so on. I, that I, I completely understand this argument, but you are, you, you still have some. We, we need to. I mean, I mean the idea is that. There are lots of dissonances in the way we think about the past, and in a way, all these people we are uh, we are so we are doing science, research, and so on. But in the political sphere, there is this idea that there would be a common narrative that would, everybody would share. But and th this is the real myth. In a way, nations are built about imposing narratives, political narratives that may, in a way, marginalize over mm -hmm. time. So what we are uh, attending is the experience, is the revival of uh, marginalized discourses that tend to, and they want to conquer uh, the center of the public space at that very moment. Mm -hmm. I have the very ungrateful task of having to bring this wonderful conversation uh, to a close, but let me just, with a couple of quick words, first first a big word of thank you to Shani, to Fanny, to Clara, and the Maison Francaise for hosting us. <laughs> But we will be back again tomorrow night because we have a wonderful event tomorrow night oh. with Sarah Mazouz, who is in the background, oh, so talking cool. about race in France. And so oh. please come back again tomorrow evening. Yes. La maison ne ferme jamais. On est ouvert sur le cap. The books here for ten dollars. If you're interested, please come on Universalism um, by by Lam Fatoumian. And last but not least, please join me in thanking our four speakers for this wonderful. <laughs> Yeah.